Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Seekers of the Supernatural. My name is Tony Spera. I'll be your moderator tonight, along with Ed and Lorraine Warren. Last show, we spoke of the Amityville Horror in our part one series. We delved more or less, Ed, into the history of Amityville mm -hmm. to the background of the house. Mm -hmm. But tonight, I think what we'd like to do is speak more of the phenomena that, that actually occurred, occurred in mm -hmm. the home. So can we begin, Ed, with some of the phenomena that did actually occur at 112 Ocean Avenue? Okay, uh, in the beginning, uh, George and Kathy would feel the psychic cold throughout all the rooms. No matter how many logs they'd throw on a fire, it was icy cold. That's because it's a psychic cold, and the cold is being drawn uh, the heat from the bodies of the people in that house is being drawn and that heat is going to be used as an energy fuel source for the spirits in that house. So they'd feel the psychic cold, they'd hear magic whispering voices throughout the hallways. Uh, at night uh, they would see ghost lights over their beds in the rooms. There was a time when George and Kathy found themselves about two foot from the ceiling George looked over at Kathy and said, do you believe this? Do you believe it? And of course, then they went and lowered themselves down into the bed again. But there would be the footsteps. Uh, there would be the um, slime that they would find on the staircase. Now, these are called apports. Mm -hmm. These materialize or dematerialize in such wanted houses. Uh, for instance, uh, in many homes that we go into, we will find that uh, you might see blood, as they did, coming down the wall. But if you went over there and touched that wall, there'd be no blood. This is a telepathic projection to the viewer, and it bypasses the physical eye, goes into the mind's eye, and they see it as a medium would see it. Uh, there was the marching uh, band, as they described it, around 3.15 in the morning when the murders had taken place. A lot of things would happen at around 3 o'clock. We call this the devil's hour mm -hmm. because it's an insult to the Trinity, anything that comes in threes. Uh, they would hear this marching band. George would jump out of bed. He'd go running down the stairs. As soon as he'd get down to the foyer, the music would stop. But he'd look into the living room, that huge living room, mm -hmm. which you'll see a picture of, and the rugs were actually rolled up and the furniture was pushed over to the sides of the walls as though somebody were actually marching there. Uh, there were so much different types of phenomena that occurred to us and the people that went in there. It was incredible. I told you about the experience last week of where I felt as I was being smothered. Mm -hmm. uh, going into that home again, uh, Lorraine felt many things. She, as a clairvoyant, would be more sensitive. Mary Pascarella, who was uh, the director of the Psychic Research Institute in Hamden, Connecticut, never went into a haunted house after that. She gave up the work Is because right? she was so badly affected by it. Mm -hmm. The cameraman uh, that went in there with Channel 5 news team uh, had heart palpitations. These guys, they were in battles in World War II. Of course, it bothered them, but never as much as going into that house there. Well, it was the physical effects on their body, Tony, mm -hmm. that was bothering them. And then one of the scientists that had come up uh, from Duke University, he became so terrified in this home, and the chair that he was sitting on actually went right backwards with him in it. They had a real hard time just stabilizing him emotionally in that home. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like, and it's true to the fact that people are affected on their weakest, most vulnerable levels. And I think many times people of science go into a home like this not really expecting to be affected personally, mm -hmm. just to be there and be witness to it. Mm -hmm. But they have nothing to fall back on. They have no faith, Tony. They can't call on any inner strength other than their own personal knowledge. Right. And in a way that, as far as I'm concerned, they can't possibly be too objective that you way. You know, Father Pecoraro told me about an experience he had when he left the house. Mm -hmm. He went back to his rectory. He was up in his room. Suddenly the room became icy cold. Ghost lights were shooting all over the place, and a deep, harsh, growling voice occurred in that room. He's seen what he described as a lizard-like creature. Now, as a demonologist, I have seen the diabolical. 
In fact, at one time, I had seen 43 of them. I knew exactly what he was talking about. It's something that you can't describe to anybody. It's something that's from another world. Mm -hmm. And as he described that, uh, you could see the terror in this man's face. He wasn't used to these types of things. And the same thing happened to him again in a hotel room in Florida with a rabbi. Mm -hmm. The both of them experienced this. And when this lizard-like creature appeared in that room to these two men, and it finally faded, the glass in the windows turned red. Now, speaking of the clergy, Lorraine, you had mentioned before, and I think we're going to see a slide of him, mm -hmm. you have mentioned Padre Pio from Italy, mm -hmm. who I believe was a, a Franciscan Yes, uh, monk. he was. He was a Franciscan um, monk. I think we're going to have a shot of him coming up. Now, if we could get that slide. Stigmata. I uh, guess here it is right yes. here. Yes. Can you explain, Ed, what He's, we're looking at here? And Lorraine, yes. either one of you. He, is, he suffered the wounds of Christ, Tony, for 50 years of his life, mm -hmm. which meant that he bled just as Christ bled on the cross. So did he bleed from his feet also? Yes, just? he did. Yes. Okay. Now, the incredible thing was that 10 minutes after this man died, yeah. 10 minutes, all of these wounds disappeared. They all were healed, really? Tony. Yes. There, there were the critics who would say, well, the man did this to himself. After he was dead, he couldn't do anything to himself. Mm -hmm. And these and, wounds simply disappeared. Okay, here's a close-up. Okay, now, here's look, a close -up of Padre look Pio. at this close-up. Look at this profile. If we could go of, back a little further and see the, the uh, hood. If we could pull back just a little yeah. bit on just that. Just a little bit, and so you can see the hood and, and the profile of the mm -hmm. man's face. Now, Padre Pio was a very holy and pious priest. And the reason I have so much devotion to him, Tony, is not only because of what happened to me in Amityville, but when I went in there, I really didn't know why I felt as uneasy as I felt. And this man had the gift of discernment, plus he physically fought devils in his life. He played such an important role of our investigation. And I think in, the next slide is going to show, yes. quite dramatically, in fact, a picture taken in the Amityville home. Lorraine, can you explain this picture? Okay, this is the wet bar room. This is the room in the front of the house, Tony, that you see. Um, where that's all the windows. Mm -hmm. Now I stood here and you can see two of the researchers are with me. I have his relic cut tight in my hand mm -hmm. and I'm asking for for his help and also oh yes okay. I'm asking for his help and his protection. Now what's that up in the antlers there? Now photographs are being taken and look at that photograph Tony and you see the outline of the very man that you just looked at the portrait of before, the photograph the hood, of. That's the hood, the beard, the nose. Isn't it? Now, the photographs that you looked at were given to us by a priest who had served with Padre Pio in life and who really helped us in documenting that particular psychic photo. I think we photo. have a cropped picture again. Uh, I believe we have a cropped picture again, if we could get the next slide up to see there it is. It's, it, that looks a, a It was also shot. a head on the antlers. What yes. is that? What is that head on? It looks Everybody like a person's said head. it looked like Ronald the Fail. To this day, we don't know what We don't is. know what that is. We really do not yeah. know what that is, Tony. We have no idea. Head, does that face, look like Ronald the Fail? Yes, it does. Yes. It looks very much like Ronald the Fail. Yes. But now, have, has anybody looked at these pictures and verified that they're yes. not fakes? Father Negre mm -hmm. looked at this photograph. He was a very close associate of Padre Pio's, and when he mm -hmm. looked at it, he knelt down and he blessed himself, and he, and he said, says, Padre, Padre Pio. Pio. And wow. he's the man who went back to his cell there at the monastery where we met with him in California, Tony. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we were getting a lot of flack when we publicly showed that photograph. It was during a period of time back in the late 70s that there was really a lot of dissension regarding religious areas and when you're showing religious proof. Mm -hmm. So I prayed to him and I said to him that if that really was him, that I wanted to be guided and directed in areas that could help me to better understand and prove out that photograph. Otherwise, we would never ever use it. Mm -hmm. And Tony, that is why after that, 
that we met Father Negre. And I'll never forget the day I had gone to Mass that particular day with a man who was in charge of ABC television in California. We're walking out. Nothing was mentioned about Padre Pio when all of a sudden this man said to me, Lorraine, did you know Padre Pio? And I said, yes. And I says, although I never met him. And he said, well, there's a priest right near here who served with him while he was still alive. Wow. Padre Pio died in 68, Tony. And this, pic and this picture was taken in 76? Yes. Now keep in mind yes. that nobody knows that Lorraine has asked for his intervention. Oh, no. She has a relic in her hands, and this picture with infrared film is taken, and there is the face of Padre Pio above her. But this next picture that we're going to see I was think this, taken is a, this is an astonishing picture, in fact. Yes, with infrared film. Oh, yes. And it's in the upstairs bedrooms. Just to the left there, you see what looks like a small boy's face looking out with bioluminescent eyes. This was the room of one of the young boys who was murdered there. Isn't that eerie? Now, a lot of people would say, well, is that the spirit of the young boy? No, it is not the spirit of the young boy, but it is a diabolical spirit with luminescent eyes that appears in that home <coughs> to confuse the investigators. But it, it, you think that is an evil spirit, Ed? Positively. Everything about this house was evil. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I was in that house one time, and nothing ever happened to me. It's not that a house is haunted 24 hours a day. You don't walk into a haunted house and see ghosts flitting all over the place. Mm -hmm. After 9 o'clock, the psychic hours start, 9 to 6 in the morning. Mm -hmm. 9 o'clock, the energy starts to build up because of the darkness. Mm -hmm. Then you start to get what we call the infestation in a house like Amityville. First, you hear the little knockings, the rappings. Then you might hear pounding sounds. Then you might hear crying or sobbing, uh, hysterical laughter. These are the types of things that actually happen in these homes. Mm -hmm. But pictures like this taken with infrared film, the camera is neither for nor against the supernatural or right. supernatural world. Right. It only takes what it sees. Mm -hmm. And what it sees here is a spirit of a diabolical nature in that room. You know what was amazing, Tony? When we met with Father Pecoraro, he invited us to get together with the family and himself so he could share with us his experiences. Now, he was kind of a no-nonsense guy, too. You know, he was a judge of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and rather stern kind of a man. Mm -hmm. And he met with us on St. Joseph's Day, and he personally break, um, baked, baked St. Joseph's bread for us. But I think the, uh, the experiences we had going to our home that night were terrible. What is this shot of it? That's Mary. Mary. who was, again, uh, the director of the Psychic Research Institute in Hamden. Mm -hmm. After she left this home, she was so badly affected that she just quit the work completely mm -hmm. and, in fact, moved out of the state and across the country. Wow. Yes, she did. So there was other psychics. There was another psychic besides yourself in there, Lorraine? Oh, yes, and, and also Dr. And Brian Riley. people? Yes. Okay, like... There okay, was, who are these people here? Now, that's the camera crew that was so badly affected, and yet both of these men had filmed at, for com, at, you know, with combat assignments, had mm -hmm. been on combat assignments. Marvin Scott himself claimed that he couldn't believe how badly these people were affected in okay, the house. And this next picture that we're going to see, who are, who okay, are these? We're people? looking at uh, Dr. Alex Tannis, a very famous psychic. Mm -hmm. who could actually project to himself in any place in the world. And the man on the right was Dr. Carlos Osis, mm -hmm. who was president of the American Society for Psychic Research. So uh, very notable people entered that home with us, Tony. When I talked with Dr. Tannis, he said to me, Ed, I came upon the most hideous and monstrous entity I had ever encountered in any haunted house. That was his actual words mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Now this next slide would be probably, I, I'm assuming, this, the communication that you had? Yes. That? Now that was very, very dangerous thing to do, to communicate in a home like that. And Tony, when I tell you about that man from Duke University and Mary Pascarella, it was during that communication that they were so hideously affected Mm -hmm. actually leaving the house, mm -hmm. they were so badly affected. Now, there were tests, I understand, done on uh, George Lutz? Oh, yes. George Lutz. Lutz had 
three lie detector tests, and so did his wife, Kathy, and they passed every one. And the man you see in the background there is Mr. Chris Gugas, mm -hmm. who was president of the Polygraph Association of America. He said to me, you know, Ed, after these people passed those tests, he said, it was so frightening what they told me that I started wearing a crucifix again that I had worn during the uh, Second World War when I was in combat. That's wow. how bad it was. And, and then you see Kathy here. She's being tested. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, voice stress tests taken also, mm -hmm. which they passed. They passed all these tests in recounting their experiences in these homes. You know, Lorraine and I have been in hundreds and hundreds of haunted houses, and we've interviewed numerous people all mm -hmm. over the world. I watch people. I look at them. I watch their body movements. I know what they should say. I know the, how they should answer me when I ask them a question. All right. These people were right on. Mm -hmm. There was no hesitation. The phenomena that they described to us was the type of thing that happens in this house. So you could say then unequivocally, unequivocally that George and Kathy were not lying, that it was not, not a lying. No, no, they, they were, were not. not lying at all, now, Tony. did this phenomena just happen in Amityville, or were you guys at all affected? Because I understand, oh, yes. We, I understand that you were affected a little bit. Never forget the night. What's this picture here? Yeah, this is the doorway night from we came home, yes. our, the main part of our house going into a passageway that leads into what is now an occult museum. But you go through the passageway, and you come into the occult museum, and then my office is at the end of that room. Mm -hmm. Now, it was after 3 o'clock, and I heard this door open up. Now, I'm quite a ways. I, I'm a good uh, 60, 70 feet away in mm -hmm. another building. But All I right. could hear that door open up. And I could hear footsteps coming up the passageway. Now, it's carpeted, so I shouldn't hear footsteps. Mm -hmm. But I thought to myself, Lorraine is coming down to bring me a cup of coffee. And yet I know that she does not want to go down into that area after mm -hmm. 9 o'clock at night because mm -hmm. of yeah. the numerous phenomena that occurred. Now, what here is I am looking out of my office into that darkened area of the museum. Okay. Mm -hmm. The doorway is just to the right of where you see a mirror way back there. Yeah. I could hear what I can describe as a swirling wind. Mm -hmm. And it came into the doorway and I could see a dark mass or what we call a uh, shadow ghost. Mm -hmm. I immediately recognized it for what it was because of the stench that accompanied it, which was okay. very foul. Right the icy coldness. Mm -hmm. I stepped into the doorway here and I held up a crucifix and it came up to me within about five feet. I commanded it in the name of Jesus Christ to leave and go back to where it came from. It backed off a little bit, came around the room and came at me again. Mm -hmm. I then took holy water and I sprinkled it on it and it backed off again. Mm -hmm. Now people think that we don't become frightened in these situations. Well, we do. Right. We're made of uh, blood and flesh just like they are. Mm -hmm. I immediately went toward the back door. I went out of the house, out of the building, I should say, and toward yep. my house. Yep. No, now, to the left there, we see the rain pipe. That's right. the building I was in. I that left small there. building there on the left? That's on the left, right. Okay. I went over toward the um, main, part of the, main part of the house. But when I got near the porch, I could hear animals fighting. Mm -hmm. I flashed my light there, and there was nothing there. Now, that was meant to frighten me as the shadow ghost was, because when a person becomes frightened, mm -hmm. they throw off psychic energy into the atmosphere, which an evil spirit can use as fuel to manifest even more phenomena. Now, uh, let me ask you a question. Was what was in that house evil? It positively was evil. There's no two, no two ways about it. Oh, yes. It's about as evil as a house can get. There's nobody out there looking at this program right now, listening to us, that can prove that the diabolical devils, demons, evil spirits don't exist. Mm -hmm. But we can prove it, and mm -hmm. we have proven it many times. How? Evidence. Mm -hmm. If you ask us for our evidence, we ask you for your evidence. We can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that haunted houses, ghosts, devils, demons do exist mm -hmm. simply because we have the evidence. Right. I understand also, Lorraine and Ed, that even years, I believe, after yes. the Amityville case that you went on, you had an incident in Pennsylvania? Yes, we did. Can you we, tell us in, about a, that? in a car that we had, a brand new car, Tony. It was a bright, sunny day. It was cold weather, but it was a bright, sunny day. Mm -hmm. And we were going eastbound uh, on 84. And we came to an area that said the promised land. Hmm. And Ed commented, and he said, something about boy the promised land a good place now ed wore 
a, a miraculous medal to the Mother of God on mm -hmm. a silver chain. But that particular morning in our hotel room, it was badly knotted. So I just picked it up and put it in my pocketbook. So at this point, Tony, I took it on my lap and do it untying or undoing all the knots. I put it over Ed's head and down into his shirt. And at that point, the next sign was the Lord's Valley. And at that point, Ed said, even the Amityville horror couldn't get us here. See, even years later, you can now, still was give a clear day. recognition. Clear day. Okay. So it was a sunny, sunny morning. No ice, no rain on the road. Tractor trailer truck was about 50 yards behind us. Mm -hmm. he was that one car witness. started to sway back and forth. The only way I can describe it is as four banana peels for, wheel, uh, for tires on an oily road. It started to spin. There was no way that I could stop that car from spinning in circles. Mm. Mm -hmm. It went up into the air. We went over the guardrail, over the guardrail, down a 40-foot embankment backwards. All this time, I was praying to the Blessed Mother. Right out loud. Tell right me. out loud. And I, I said, help us, save us. And that car, I felt, was going to hit the gas tank at the bottom, and it was going to burst into flames. The car turned over. Mm -hmm. I had a heck of a job getting Lorraine out because it was a two-door two car, and I had to push her out. I got out, but by that time, there was already a state trooper who had been on the other side of the highway and had heard a truck driver 50 yards in back of us describing what was happening. And they yelled down to us, is there anybody else in that car? No, is so there anybody no. alive in that car? We went up the embankment. Now, you're not going to believe this. We went up the embankment. That car went down, turned over, and I was thinking to myself, miraculously, we were saved, and we were. How are we going to get home? A train? Was I going to rent a car? The record came out, pulled our car up. There was not one scratch on that car. Not one scratch. And remember, it went over a guardrail, down a 40-foot embankment backwards, and mm -hmm. turned over. That was almost like a miracle in itself. It was a miracle in itself, Tony. And I think it had a great deal to do with the intercession of our faith at that time. Which proves one thing, Tony, that God is more powerful than any devil. Mm -hmm. Now, can you kind of sum up for us, uh, Lorraine, or Ed, yeah. about George and Kathy now, today, or, or since the horror and they left and after well, they fled? it's taken its toll on this family. They are divorced. They are living apart from each other. Uh, today, there are five children involved, pretty grown up at this point. But um, they still communicate, probably for the sake of the children. Mm -hmm. But it certainly took its toll. But I have to say that of all the cases that I ever worked on, that that case affected our personal lives more than any case we ever worked Anybody on. Anybody that went into that home in Amityville and said that it was a hoax, was never in that house. No. They never went in that house. They never talked with the Lutzes. They never met any of the central figures in the case itself. They never talked with Father Pecoraro, ourselves, the investigators. There's one thing that I can say about the Amityville case, that, again, on a scale of 1 to 10, that could be a 12. <laughs> Really? And I would never want to go into another house like that. And it was a reality. So one thing I'd like to clear up, if I could, People say that George and Kathy Lutz became millionaires. Is that no, true? No, no. Oh. George and Kathy Lutz God, no. made very little money. Any money that they made was taken by lawsuits by these crazies that were instigating all of these here hoax stories against them, thinking they could get money. The only people that made money on that case was Jay Anson, who wrote the book. He had never written a, be a book before on the mm -hmm. supernatural. He would have written it a lot different than he did. When he came to our house, I tried to explain to him that he had to describe the phenomena in terms of psychic research rather than to the layman saying the banister exploded before their very eyes. Well, anybody knows that when they went in there, the banister didn't explode, but it did through telepathic hypnosis, mm -hmm. and that's what mm -hmm. he should have said. You know, he was on the last chapter of that book, and he had a heart attack, which he recovered from, thank God, and when he recovered, he finished the book. He then sent the manuscript to a woman in New York City to type up for him. The man who was bringing the manuscript was at a red light. Suddenly, the car felt as though it was going into a hole. He looked out, and the car was sinking into the road. 
He jumped out, and the next morning, they pulled that car out of a 15-foot hole. Everything was soaking wet except the manuscript, which was then given to that woman to retype. And the night that she finished it, there was a fire in her house, and she and her son just about escaped. Jay Anson had never written a book before. That was the first book, The Amityville Horror. He tried for a second book, 666, the which, Antichrist. of course, means the devil. On the last chapter, he had a heart attack, and he died. Unbelievable story. Mm -hmm. So you would consider the Amityville Horror one of your oh, yeah. worst cases uh, ever? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, it is one I don't of think there's worst. any place that you could go in our civilized world and somebody hasn't heard of, that, of the Amityville Horror. Right. The only ones that try to say that it's a hoax are the atheists, uh, people who have an ax to grind, mm -hmm. but people who understand the area of demonology and theology know that there are many Amityville horrors out there and that people have investigated them and will continue to investigate such cases for many, many years to come. Mm -hmm. Again, if someone has a problem, I'd like to always end the show with this if I could, mm -hmm. because there are people I know from experience that have many, many problems, many people out there. How can they contact the famous Ghostbusters, Ed and Lorraine Warren? They can write to us, Tony, at our post office box, which is post office box 41, in Monroe, Connecticut, mm -hmm. 06468. If okay. you feel that you're living in a haunted house, don't hesitate to call us. No. We will be glad to come out and see what's going on. Uh, if you have any problems that you think are supernatural or preternatural, call us, write us a letter, and we'll try to help you out. Also, Tony, if there's questions they have, that they can write you a letter. Yes. They can write you a letter, right, and explain what's happening. Exactly. We'll be glad to answer those letters. Be happy to. Very good. So that. Ladies and gentlemen, is Amityville Parts 1 and 2. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, for Lorraine Warren, for Ed Warren, I'm Tony Sparrow. Good night.